So our format for today, we're going to begin with a brief presentation from Homeworld Collective, followed by area specific conversations in four different breakout rooms where you can ask lots of questions and, and discuss with the team. Um, a little bit about work on climate. Um, we're a community of over 29,000 members. Um, so if for anyone who doesn't know work on climate, uh, you should check us out. We're a nonprofit organization and the world's largest, most active community addressing talent shortages in climate. Um, we're on a mission to transform the talent ecosystem and build the workforce humanity needs to solve uh, climate change equitably and justly. Um, Nicolette like, put in some um, links in the chat so you can check it out there. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Dan Goodwin, uh, co-founder and executive director of Homeworld Collective. Take it away, Dan. All right. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Sound good? All right. Uh, so, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan. I'm going to be speaking uh, as one of the four team members of Homeworld Collective today. Our whole mission here is just to make this a dialogue and help share our journey with you our mission at Homeworld, which is a 501c3, is to build the community of climate biotech. So there's a lot of spiritual alignment with work on climate. Uh, and huge thank you to Angela, Felix, and Nicolette for hosting us. Love what you all are doing here, and we're thrilled to build for the opportunity. So let me just do a quick screen share. And so the first thing we want to do is before we say anything, we want to hear from you all, um, meaning like, this is not a YouTube chat. Right? You're taking an hour out of your day to be here present with other people. So ask us things. We have stuff that we're gonna talk about, but as you're gonna hear from our journey, it took us two years or even more to get to where we are now. And so a big mission that brings us here is to help you in your journey. So before we go anywhere, I just wanna make some time just to hover on the slide and use the chat to say things that you want us to make sure we touch on. So what we're gonna be doing just as you're to give you a sense, we're going to do maybe 20 minutes of me blabbing. So this is where your questions will help guide that. Then we're going to do a breakout, and then we're going to come back together. So I really do encourage you to use this chat. I can just speak forever, but I really want to make sure that if there's things that you came into with your mind, is it how to fundraise? Is it how to get a job? Is it what are interesting problems? This is the time. So I'd really love to hear from you all. And if not, you're just stuck with my stump speech. All right, so Greg's got the first question. Yeah, so uh, all curious about roles and skills are in high demand. How can non-scientists further the mission? Is it advocacy by whom? These are great. Working in biotech as a non-scientist and curious about roles and opportunities. Okay. Let's give it 30 more seconds. Anything else that people want to hear? Biotech influencing regenerative farming. So I'm going to flag right ahead that we're not going to talk about that too much today. Um, we will talk about one topic. Great. Where do we see biotech making the long, the biggest impact in the short term? Love this. How can people in other, other in other industries such as designers collaborate? I think this is great. Um, nice. Okay. How can somebody as a communicator shift? All right. This is great. So thank you very much. This gives us a lot to talk about today. And so now we can jump in and give you all a sense of who we are. And excuse me while I set a timer to make sure that I keep us on track. Um, so I'm gonna just start by letting you know who I am, kind of my journey, because I think it's probably gonna resonate with a lot of people here. So actually, briefly, sorry. Uh, one thing just, and as the I can see this from the questions already, like we're gonna be talking about large scale problems, hidden challenges. This is not, our mission is not to be a, like a survey of startups or market opportunities. Really like wanna, talk more from the science first and some of the big problems first. Uh, the reason is, is that there's great resources already for going through that. So work on climate, a really, we at Homeworld love what work on climate is doing and thinks it's a fantastic resource. Uh, climate Tech VC by Sightline is a fantastic resource as well for companies and deals. Uh, and then also our board member and friend, uh, Sarah, who started Voyager VC, does like is an example of like a really good VC firm that's always writing about opportunity spaces. So for those things, there are like, there are good resources for startups. And if you're looking for a job, the best advice I have there is go to good VCs and look at their portfolio pages or go to the Homeworld Jobs page. And we'll tell you more about that soon for the Climate Biotech Jobs Board. But briefly, I want to just give you a sense a little about myself and where I'm coming from because I'm a weird mutt. And our journey, you know, in my journey, everyone's journey to Homeworld has been different. Uh, I was doing a PhD in 2009 at Stanford under Fei-Fei Lee and Fei-Fei 
I think was really instrumental in the deep learning revolution because she created ImageNet where that became the main data challenge for everyone working on algorithms that end up creating what we now know as deep learning. Uh, I then dropped out of that because I was spending all my time in startups. I ended up being an entrepreneur in residence and I built an app with Elmo and Sesame Street, obviously. Uh, my first company was uh, at a mobile app company. We started in 2011 and we were just doing a very simple, straightforward thing where we were tracking the miles that people drive using the data that's automatically captured in the smartphone. Um, at age 30, I went back to retrain as a biologist. And I think this is worth saying that just like for me, like all my biggest heroes are the people who pick one thing in life and commit their whole life to it. And at age 30, I thought that was gonna be neuroscience and neuro ended up being my gateway drug into synthetic biology. And synthetic biology is what got me thinking about climate. Now, we did really cool synthetic biology work in the context of the brain, which is a really complex system. And so we built brand new sequencing technologies to count individual molecules inside neurons, did things like creating transgenic mice or creating you know, like payloads to make neurons express certain developments. But really, for me, getting involved with synthetic biology was realizing that you've got this really powerful toolkit that you could do anything with. And if you could do anything with it, well, let's help the planet. So we built a community and this was around like this, this timeline stops around 2021. And for two and three years, Paul Reginato, my co-founder and I just kind of dug around trying to figure out how we use our biotech training to do something meaningful for climate. And what came out was actually like a beautiful thing, but a community grew and the community grew and grew. And then eventually we realized that the struggles that we were having are common across the whole field. Like the reason that I was struggling to start another company and the reason like Paul was struggling to find like the right next role is that a lot of these things that need to exist just didn't. And there was these common needs. And I think that just brings a lot of people here today. So what started as being supported by the community ended up becoming supported by a lot of leading philanthropies. And so Homeworld Collective is a 501c3 nonprofit, which means we don't do advocacy. We don't do politics. We think a lot about what is action oriented climate optimism, which is heavily focused on science and technology. We use this word climate biotech a lot, which doesn't seem to exist. And so we're really trying to push it and it's gonna be a big theme of today. But everyone always asking, well, what is climate biotech? And we think about it as it's just utilizing biology to build a thriving future for all life in the face of climate change. And that's an intentionally broad arc, right? But we, the, the shorthand that we use is just climate biotech. It's, it's a phrase we gotta use a lot. And I really love this phrase that uh, Paul, the co-founder, said, which just stuck with me, it's like when we worked in neuroscience, we built tools to look at things that are too small to see. But now that we work on climate, we've got the opposite problem where we work on things that are too big to see. And I think there's just so, I mean, he's a poet and it shows in that line, but it really like becomes clear when you think about these big problems in life. And when you're stuck on Zoom or you're stuck in New York or you're stuck in like a city, like you don't go to these places where there's really large things happening and it's very hard to be tangible. Right. And so these are just a couple example spaces of where like where there's like a high fulcrum of things happening. But we're not, you know, how many people have been to Greenland here, right, or gone to take samples in the Puget Sound River to understand why the coho salmon are dying. Right. And so this is these are the areas that I think are very high impact. And there's this big problem with tangibility. Right. How do you get people who really care and have skills they want to put to work, but they're physically not there? And it's hard to understand what the problems are to work on. So. The other thing that we get a lot is like, well, okay, and this was a question in the chat, like, okay, well, what does biotech do? Like, why, you know, why should we care about biotech when we think about climate? The shortest answer is that, well, every major flux that influences like the greenhouse gases and, and warming goes through biology in some way. So carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, that all goes through biology. And so it, since biology is like, you could say in some ways part of the problem, a victim of the problem. It's very important to think this could be a high leverage point to be developing tools. And another way to think about this, and once again, like you really, it's hard to think about scale sometimes, but I like thinking about a single tree and I like thinking about the whole globe, right? When you look at chlorophyll concentration, so like where are the photosynthetic organisms? And you find these really weird niches, like, you know, and why is that? And this has been part of our journey Right, we are like Paul and I both come from bench lab scientists where we didn't think about ocean currents or upwelling that's bringing up nutrients, right? Or the opportunity areas that maybe these are organisms, you know, the something that would not be an immediately obvious sub problem to think about. So, 
And I, I also just want to urge everyone just to be dropping questions in as we go. I think a, an important problem is like, and people ask us this time, like, you know, where are the short-term opportunities? What are jobs? I think it's, we say this a lot and it's it's more and more true the more like we dig in, we work with the communities that like climate biotech is hard in both science and business. Meaning like a lot of biotech today is focused on medical biotech and that works because it's just science risk. For the most part, if you can drug something, you will get paid for it. Um, but when you talk about something like carbon dioxide removal, which is might be one of the most mature subfields of climate biotech, even that is a hard field because there's so many assumptions, right? How long is the carbon market going to be around? What's the eventual price of carbon? Who's going to be the buyer after the billion dollar philanthropy dries up? Will there be government buyers, right? But everyone agrees that we need some sort of carbon dioxide removal. And this is a very important area to be working in. Another one is microbes and metal, uh, microbes, metals, minerals interface. So this is an amazing photo from uh, Ceci Gomez's lab at UC Berkeley. These are showing that um, they can culture microbes specific to where the lanthanides are, rare earths. Um, this is a very, undis like, I think, underappreciated area of biology so far. For many reasons, I think one, it might, maybe medical biotech has sucked away some energy, right? But then the other part is that like, these are very opaque problems. Because when we talk about mining, you talk about one of the oldest industries there are hidden behind these enormous factories. And so this is part of what gets Homeworld really excited is that what can we do to help expose the important problems in there that are actionable by small teams, you know, either as researchers or startups or people just getting started. This is probably the weirdest one I'm going to say is just like an area. So I'm going to skip over it very quickly. But I would just say that when you think about biotech, you think about bioethics a lot. And I think that's good. I do think that there is this weird idea. Some people call it open deployments. Other people call it other things. But if you want to put the potential of bio out in the world, there is this. There's a lot of regulation right now, and there's a lot of people trying to build safety, like safety catches. So, like if you were to deploy an organism, how would you stop it from going wild or disrupting the ecosystem? And I'm only putting this in there because very few people study this seriously. What does it mean to put in a safety switch? Is there such a thing as a safety switch? And I think because it's such a taboo topic, not enough people work on it, um, except for very established professors that do it as a side gig. And so I would just say that like safety, building tools for safety, I think is underappreciated uh, for really getting the most of what bio can do. Um, another one that we've been pushing on for a bit is like the idea of pollution caused diseases. So it's not climate in terms of like greenhouse gases, but there is climate in terms of anthropogenic chemicals being dumped in the world people are being affected by it, the whole biosphere is being affected by it. And while there's a lot of statistical work and policy work, we don't see a lot of people thinking about it from the end, like the organism up. How do you, like the, thinking about bioresilience to these sort of challenges. And so this is just in a field where like, this is hard in science and this is hard in business, but this is a very, very important problem. And I'm sure we've all seen the PFAS and the pesticides and all these things like the endocrine disruptor chemicals, like all these things are in the world and we know they're bad, but nobody's taking it seriously on how to make them less bad or how to protect the biosphere that's already been affected by it. And the last one is that if you really go geek out for a second on what biology can be in the long term, the phrase that we use is that atom is atomically precise and infinitely scalable, right? So bio is built on proteins that can do these operations on, like, on the atom level which is such a huge potential if we can really harness it all the way to industry scale. And I don't think we're fully there yet, but if you push yourself on like, what's the upper bounds, the image that I like hovering on is the idea that well, we, we should have chemical plants in our, that fit in our hand. Um, and I don't think this is unreasonable. Um, I just think this is pretty far out and it just needs ambitious people that are well-supported and well-funded to take this thing seriously. So, there's all these big places, there's all these big opportunity areas, there's lots of room for great talent working on this. Well, why, what's holding us back? And one of the, like what we see holding back is that one, like medical biotech has a lot of gravity. And this is not to talk smack on medical biotech. I think there's a lot we can learn from it and appreciate why really good people go work on rare subtypes of cancers or orphan diseases that can get pushed quickly through the FDA. I think there's a lot to appreciate there. And for people that have worked in startups, we know that it's really important to have exit strategies or companies that can buy you or recipes for success. And I think the big truth is right now, there's not a lot of recipes for success in climate biotech. But what there is, 
is a lot of interest from capital sources trying to help people start. And so I just, I think it's very important to understand the challenges going in. And so this is one thing and happy to explore more in the breakouts. Um, you know, one thing that we've noticed a lot, and I'll, I'll give it a little bit more color on the next page, is that people don't know the important problems the biotech could work on. And so Paul and I both finished our PhDs at MIT, and it took us two years to find good problems to work in climate biotech, right? And so one of our missions at Homeworld is to speed that up for other people. But what we see, like a, a pattern is that people get, say they want to work in climate, do some Googling, find the, like, the first thing that's like three hits deep and then go work on something that, you know, six months later ends up being a dead end. And so I think it's really important to do the science driven work to like help surface the important problems. And we'll also talk about some of the work that we're doing there. And I think the one other thing that's worth just being brutal about is that the be, there's not startup, there's not a lot of successes yet in climate biotech. There's a few companies that are really promising, but the other thing that's not there is an appropriate funding stack. And so what we've seen so far is a lot of venture capitalists who work in software try to go work in climate biotech. And then I think that worked, that looked really good in 2021, but the financial situation, we're in, we're in a different part of a cycle. It's still a good time for young startups starting, but I think we're going to see a lot of creative destruction from companies founded in the 2021 uh, vintage. And so I just said it to be like realistic. Obviously, like we're very, very optimistic on the space. But if you're struggling and you're not getting callbacks and you're looking for jobs, I would say like that is one of the headwinds from companies that are, were funded in roughly 2020, 2021. So that's where we're at, <laughs> right? But where, where are we going? And so I think it's worth saying that a big thing that Homeworld did last year is we gave away $1.3 million, specifically trying to encourage ambition towards solving big problems. And what we did is we built our own grant granting system. We created public discourse and hopefully people here have seen it. The other thing that we can do is we can look at, well, what are those 65 projects looking at? What are the problems that people were trying to solve? And we were specifically looking for people using protein engineering, the solution. And so we saw a lot of carbon removal, right? We saw some food and ag. We saw a lot of plastics more than we might've been expecting. But when we look at this as a team, we say, well, there's no methane or nitrous, right? David uh, Allen asked in the chat, like, what are some of the biggest things we can do short term? Methane is a huge one. And that is inherently a biological problem. And we didn't get a single person proposing a project with methane. We didn't really see many serious efforts on metals or minerals, meaning like people coming from the mining industry or speaking that they understood how that industry works. Um, we saw plastics, but it was just one type of plastic. And then this might just be that we were looking for protein engineering, but we didn't really see people speaking the language of ecosystem restoration or genetic diversity. So that is to say, there's a lot of areas that we would like to see more efforts into. And so I'm going to hop through just kind of briefly the trends and then some uh, some specific areas. So where you'll see stuff now, biomanufacturing is, I think, emerging from the bottom of a bust cycle. Um, food security and sustainability is always going to be important and even more important moving forward. Agriculture and materials, I think, is where we've seen stuff. I think moving forward, I think it is worth being optimistic about the greenhouse gas removal industry. So that's carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous. Geobiotechnology is a big buzzword, but like really what we're talking about is engineering biology in the context of geology, which can touch carbon capture, it can touch energy, it can touch metals and minerals. Ocean biotech. Sounds weird, right? Like I think from people that come from standard synthetic bio, but there's so many important things there. Probably one of the biggest ones is also carbon capture, um, you know, while pre preserving the, uh, the the ocean ecology. Pollution, I talked briefly about, I think that is going to grow in importance. And then plastics, I think circular economy, getting like coming up with new melt, like uh, polymers, I think is going to be very important. So very briefly, I just want to hop through a couple of things and hopefully these things are moderately new. And if not, uh, excuse me, I'll, I'll step through them quickly. When you talk about carbon capture, if you look at this chart from 2017, you'll see that there's this little blip saying we're going to have a gigaton of capture per year by 2030. If, if that is the net negative emissions that we're going to have by 2030, you can look at what our deliveries and carbon capture are today. And it means that we need to double our capacity every year for the next decade if we're going to get there. And maybe we can, just letting everyone know, like doubling every year would be the most monumental technology development that's ever happened. And I think that's why bio is so important. 
because we need new lenses into it. One solution is enhanced rock weathering. And shout out to our friends at Mati, uh, Mati Carbon in India, where they, I think, had a really smart idea where enhanced rock weathering is letting the natural rocks weathering cycle happen, but in an accelerated way. If there's also this argument that it can benefit agriculture too. So Shantanu, uh, who runs this company, had this great insight that in this specific spot in India, they're right next to a basalt mine. And so just taking the mine tailings, putting it on soil is actually helping both the yields for the farmers and capturing carbon. And it's a really beautiful idea and a fantastic team. So I'd give them a specific shout out. The other thing to think about is nitrogen management. All right. Uh, and just saying like everyone talks about carbon dioxide, methane, but nitrogen is also extremely important. And we know that comes from agriculture. Um, you know, 50% of that comes from that uh, from ag fields, and then that's strongly linked to fertilizer usage, but even that's not fully understood. So if that is the problem, then we've been, you know, like, one thing is, can we just make self-fertilizing plants? This has been around for a while. You've got Kula and Pivot Bio, good startups that are operating. We, in our problem statement repository, we have, I like, you know, a well-framed problem that if you want to get into this, we can help you land in it. You know, and you can just read this for free and find things to work on. Just know that nitro the nitrogenase is a famously very, very hard protein. And the reason that it works, and this is for the bio geeks in the audience, is that when people have tried to engineer it, there's so many subunits that it's very hard just to shove into something. So you need the whole purpose of this problem statement is can you make it small enough that you could actually put it into plants feasibly and stepping over a lot of things for a shortness. So if you want to get involved, uh, we built a jobs board to help centralize the climate biotech community. It's so disparate right now. There's so many different areas. Shout out to our team at Ariana, who you're about to meet. Um, <clears throat> and in that, you can find both places to find jobs, but then also post like post yourself in the talent network. So just go to jobs.homeworld.bio. The other thing is that we have a newsletter, which I saw on the chat. So there's two kind of closing things because we also talked about, we want to give you guys pathways. So one, like we've got a lot of writings on this from Homeworld. So the ones I would point on the Homeworld blog is that this kind of salty one, we wanted solar punk, but we instead we got mon monoclonal antibodies. This is talking about why climate biotech is hard in both science and business. If you want to know where the problems are, uh, we wrote a whole blog post explaining our problem statement repository. And then the third one is just to say that when I talk about capital stacks and like how to support entities, We've been doing some early work trying to think about how we can get more funding to support the things that aren't startups and aren't yet academic or you know, too big for academia. And so that's something that we've been working on. And you can see that on my personal blog while we, when we workshop the ideas in public. So you want to know some pathways? We would say there's three kind of pathways to think about. For the people who are saying, like, I'm non-technical, that like I would say, like, working in a big company that really operates on these problems is a great place to start. A lot of times people will contact us and they say like, oh, I'm just so nervous about the climate and blah, blah, blah. And you know, and then what I always tell people is like, that can't be the only thing that gets you involved. Because as soon as you really work on a climate problem, you're no longer working on climate. You're working in the mining industry, you're working in the energy industry, right? Unless, you know, there, with very few exceptions, like you're working deep in an industry and that's great. So finding, like going there with non-technical roles can be an amazing leverage point to later kind of go somewhere else. You can go train in academia. Academia is changing under our feet, and I think that's a good thing. Um, but it is cool to think about that going up through the, the talent development is also like is also a good way, and this is what Homeworld also aims to help. And the other thing is that if you want to start working on your own ideas, then I want to just give you some basic like closing advice, which is to get doing as quickly as possible. I think for people who really want to work on climate, it's easy just to chase your tail all day. And it's really easy just to read the latest disaster porn and feel terrible about yourself and like go say mean things online, right? Or you could just start doing stuff. And so from our personal journey, uh, you know, this was my birthday in 2021 trying to get involved with climate. And I just did the dumbest experiment possible because I just wanted to do something. And that silly, bad experiment ended up just being a little bit of intuition building. When there was a big uh, train crash in uh, East Palestine, Ohio. We were there three weeks after the crash to take samples. Why? Because we were doing something and just trying to build intuition. And if you, you know, I think the most like straightforward thing that everybody can do is that if you, you know, don't have access to lab and you don't feel technical and like whatever your skill set is, you can always write. And so for me personally, writing has been an incredibly powerful part of my career. 
It's a great way to set up meetings with people because you can say, hey, look, I wrote this thing. Can I get feedback on it? It shows people that you're building a body of work because you care. And I think that's something like the, the biggest kind of closing advice is that if you're trying to figure out how to get started, the thing I tell everybody is just write. And that's a great way to start building your, your credibility and your, your, your professional capital. So on that, I want to we're going to split up into some breakout rooms. And it's also a great opportunity to introduce the Homeworld team. The way we're gonna do this is that we're gonna go through and the, we're gonna break up the breakout rooms by like the main question that would have spoken to us if we were in the audience you know, a few years ago ourselves. And so you've already heard about me, so I'm gonna be very quick, but in the breakout room, the question I would have is if I was in the audience, I was like, look, I've got a software and startup background and where do I go to be impactful? So I'd love to now pass it over uh, to my colleague and co-founder, Paul Reginato, to introduce himself and say what questions he would be asking if, if he was in the audience. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Paul Reginato. I'm the science director here at Homeworld Collective. Um, uh, my my background is in biotechnology. Did a PhD um, uh, in co-advised by Ed Boyden and George Church at uh, MIT. I was doing foundational technology development for cell biology and tissue biology um, when I like redirected into climate tech. Um, and really, my work at Homeworld is uh, focused on on road mapping and helping the community identify priority problems that need to be addressed more at the research level. And so if you want to talk about um, frontier challenges of technology, um, join my breakout room. I can't promise that I will be an expert on every uh, frontier technology challenge, but uh, I'm happy to talk about stuff with you. Hopefully there's input from audience members and we can also just talk about what it means to pick a good problem and how to break problems down. Uh, and I'll pass it on to Ariana. Yeah, hi, my name is Ariana Kayati. Um, I was a PhD in chemistry that kind of was really unhappy with like the medical direction in which my research was going. And I just was not fulfilled in, in that space. And then I was, I, I le ended up leaving my PhD to pursue more climate focused work. So now I'm kind of like a scientist, a very academic scientist who's shifting towards being in a climate space in a totally different direction than my original research. So join my breakout round if you're having something similar where you, you were in an academic kind of lab and you want to, or a scientist and you want to shift in something more climate based, based or and something like that. Um, yeah, I can answer any questions related to those. Um, and then I'll pass it to Paul Himmelstein. Hi everyone, my name's Paul. Uh, I am the operations lead at Homeworld. Uh, my background is in nonprofit fundraising, political activism, education. I was in the classroom for a minute. And so <clears throat> you can come to me for uh, questions about being a non-technical professional in this space. Um, generalists, ops, fundraisers, pivoting. I could even field some marketing questions as well. Um, so yeah, happy to talk to y'all. Ask back Dan. Cool. So that's us. And we would love to just geek out with anybody who wants to come into the different breakout rooms. And then I love how vibrant this chat has been. So just to set up expectations, we'll go break out. We'll discuss these things in person and then come back. Uh, and discuss kind of the big ideas from each breakout room. And I think it's also worth saying that we have, we'll we'll make sure to finish this with, like if you wanna just reach out to us at the end. And so for qu any questions that weren't answered, sorry if we missed them today, but reach out anytime, either socially or over email. So that will turn to the work on climate team to, to break us up. Yeah, um, why don't we just hop around and we'd love to just see if there's like a one minute share from each, each group. Um, I can brief, I'll, I'll set it off and I'll keep it very short. Um, in the the startup software uh, kind of ecosystem, I think we had interesting conversations about the role of marketing and conversations and like how that can roll. And one of the kind of provocations I was giving was that it actually like for the marketing positions, it's actually great to market the funders and the corporate needs, not more than maybe the existing startups um, is one provocation. And the other thing was that we were talking about the needs for um, kind of putting techno-economic analysis and life cycle analysis in earlier. And then also, as some people are struggling to find jobs, 
uh, the power of writing to build the body of work, um, no matter what that takes. Um, but overall, very, very cool people and very diverse projects. And so very impressed um, and honored to be in that room. Uh, Paul H., would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, people with non-technical background hung out. We shared a lot of similar experiences of like, oh, how do I triangulate like create a trans like establish transferable skills from either project management or like being an HR professional. Um, and a lot of it came down to uh, networking, of course, but also like taking the time to reflect on like our career journeys, what lights us up, what makes us not so happy, and letting that set up our inter informational interviews. Um, and just coming from a place of like being willing to ask really basic questions to get insight into like what could be transferable. And we talked a little bit as well about how in like frontier tech spaces, like everybody knows each other. And so a great way to establish job stability is to like get in uh, in like early stage companies so that if something does happen, like you get warm introductions very quickly and earning your way through a contract and showing that you are like a mobile team member. Um, yeah, and it was really fun. And feel for everyone, um, I can drop my email in the chat if you have further questions. So Paul, yeah, Albert, you. Go for it, pass this in the Hey, you do it, you do it, you do it. Paul Reginato. Hey, um, yeah, so we talked about um, what's the process of identifying an important problem and linking that problem to what happens downstream of solving it, making sure that you're not like sort of like inventing a hard problem for yourself to solve just so that you have something to do. Um, and uh, we talked about um, uh, the, the role of design and like industrial design and product design in finding, um, finding applications for like, a material, let's say that you can manufacture at a particular cost point, like finding the right product that that can fit into uh, on the journey to making product to making materials manufacturing better and cheap, better and cheaper. Um, we also talked about like um, the value of really big, almost sci-fi seeming goals like de-extinction, which might only come to fruition in after many decades, but uh, having a story and uh, a sort of convergence point for a lot of basic research that eventually could reach some kind of holy grail as long as we have um, uh, stories like that in mind, but also the importance of, you know, not relying on deep future uh, uh, science fiction seeming ideas to um, be solutions to the immediate uh, challenges that we have with with climate change and sort of the the value of ideas that are at different stages in between, like solving problems today, solving problems in TBD many decades, and um, the intervening time in between. And maybe we can pass. I think we're at we're at time, but maybe we can get a couple minutes in for Ariana to also discuss what went on in the breakout room. Yeah, um, we had a lot of people who were uh, transitioning scientists who had a scientist background that are interested in like working on some bit climate issues. So it was really interesting to see everyone's kind of background and then like uh, what topics they were interested in. And then it was, it was, it was, I gave some people some resources on what companies to look at, what kind of like how to maybe start their transition and what to look for. Um, so I hope that was helpful. And it was really great to talk with everyone who were in that space because I was recently there, so I understand. Awesome. So thank you all so much. Hopefully that was useful. Any follow-ups, ping us on LinkedIn or Twitter and I'll pass it over to, to Felix. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you um, to our friends at Homeworld Collective for, for putting on that presentation and having those conversations with us. Uh, real quick, the both of our teams would love if you have a moment to, to give us some feedback on the um, event today. It should take no longer than three minutes. And uh, we really appreciate y'all being here, spending your time with us and um, 
yeah, we'll have links in the chat for anyone who wants to keep up with us. And we'll also send those links in a follow-up email. So thanks very much. And y'all have a great day.